Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Horizon. It is good to see all of you here this morning, many of you decked out in your patriotic colors as it is Memorial Day weekend. May we not forget what uh, that day is really all about, remembering those who have fallen in service to our great nation. But I'm glad all of you have chosen to spend your morning here uh, together as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you now to stand and make each other feel welcome as we begin our time of worship. If you will, join with me in looking at our announcements this morning. Coming up Wednesday night, it will be our last Wednesday night together before we take our summer break, and we will celebrate with a church-wide cookout and volleyball from 6 to 8. Uh, please uh, sign up for uh, supper uh, to let us know that you will be here and uh, what side you might be willing to contribute to our volleyball and cookout as the church will provide Hamburgers, hot dogs, buns, and drinks. Uh, so if you're coming, we ask that you bring side dishes and desserts. Uh, please sign up so that we know who all will be here and can plan accordingly. Uh, everyone in the church is also invited to come and celebrate Robert Floyd's 90th birthday. Coming up on Saturday, June 1st in the Fellowship Hall here at Horizon. It's a drop-in party from 2 to 4. They've requested no gifts, uh, but that your presence is gift enough. Uh, so I do hope that you will make plans to come out and celebrate with Robert and his family. Last but not least, I hope you've got it on your calendar already. Uh, Vacation Bible School uh, will be June 10th through the 13th. Um, if you uh, haven't signed up to, to volunteer yet, I'm sure Katie can still use some volunteers. You can get with her and let her know uh, that you're interested in serving in Bible school. But I always look forward to that. And I was just kidding about that being the last one. I just... Uh, Remember this one? Uh, during June and July, we will be having our favorite hymns moment during our service again. That's always a popular thing uh, during the summertime. So if you want to submit a favorite hymn to uh, Jim, uh, you can do that uh, via email or by texting him. That contact information is there in the bulletin. Jim, I want to go ahead and formally request victory in Jesus every Sunday during the month of June and July. <laughs> Most of you know that story by now. If you don't, I'll tell it to you later. But um, I keep all these things in mind as we head into the summer months. Thank you. Katie beat you to the punch. We've already had this discussion. <laughs> she told me exactly which Sunday we could sing Victory in Jesus. Something to do with the delivery or something. Uh, please stand as we open our uh, service with hymn number 62, God of Our Fathers.
As we observe Memorial Day on this Memorial Day weekend, I hope each one of us will take time to pause and reflect on the true meaning of what this day really means to us. You know, we, so many have given ultimate sacrifices. We have been privileged to be born in a country that if freedom was ours at the very beginning. But that freedom was not free. It was paid for by many that came before us to give us the liberties we have today. <clears throat> In 1941 through 1945, this country was involved in World War II. It was a war that was to do away with all other wars. Some 430,000 people, men and women, gave the ultimate sacrifice during that war, fighting for freedom against Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany. <laughs> then in 1950 to 1953, Korean War was held. Some referred to it as a Korean conflict. It was more than that, it was a war. We lost 33,000 men <coughs> during that war and more than half of that number wounded. And in the mid 60s, late 1960s, American servicemen found <coughs> once again on foreign soil fighting for freedom in the jungles of Vietnam. Fit, over 57 men were killed during that war. So Memorial Day is a, our tribute to those who have given the supreme sacrifice. If you would now take your bulletin, look at the Memorial Day litany. Let's read responsively. I will read the light print and you the dark. Let us begin our worship service with a moment of remembrance. We remember the fallen soldiers and the sacrifice they made for the sake of others. Let us begin our worship service with a moment of thankfulness. We thank God for brave men and women who gave their lives so that we may worship without fear. Let us begin our time of worship with a prayer of confession. For prayer is the only thing that we can give to those who gave their eternity. God of every nation, as we remember those who gave their lives for our sake, let us be stirred to action in their memory. We confess that we have not done all that is possible to promote peace and justice in our world. We have not loved our neighbors, let alone our enemies. Forgive us for failing to live up to your commandments. Empower us to work for your kingdom in this world and welcome us by your grace into your kingdom in the next. Amen. Thank you, O.G. The choir anthem that we're singing today is God Bless America. If you will... Uh, have your bulletin out there is a section that the congregation joins in and I will turn around from the choir and, and direct you as we as we begin that part you probably don't really need your uh, bulletin you know the words I'm sure by heart but just so you'll know where where to come in
Not only is it Memorial Day weekend, but it is graduation season. And I am happy to recognize three graduates within our church family for their accomplishments this morning. Susan Guerin graduated from Georgia Highlands College with an Associate of General Studies and Associate of Science. John Ethan Herod graduated from the University of Georgia, the Terry College of Business with a Master's in Business Administration. And Sarah Gabriel Mosley graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology College of Engineering with a Master's in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. <laughs> That's hard enough just to say. But congratulations to all of our graduates. May we remember them as they move forward in their lives, and not only those graduates within our church family, but those who have graduated all over our community and region and country as they take their, their next steps. It's always an important milestone to graduate, and may God bless them in all their future endeavors. Thank you. All the children, come forward, please. Good morning. So today is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's about a lady named Lydia. And we don't know a whole lot about Lydia. We know that she was a seller of purple cloth which tells us that she probably was pretty wealthy because purple cloth was pretty expensive, okay? Um, and we also know that on the Sabbath, which was the day they went to church, the day they worshipped, she went down to the river with other women, and she gathered there for prayer. At the same time she went this one, with this one Sabbath, Paul, who was listening to God and changed his plans, followed God to the same place by the river and began to preach. Lydia listened to what Paul was saying about Jesus and decided that she, too, wanted to know about Jesus. So she made the decision to follow Jesus and be baptized in that river. Then not only did she believe, but people around her, her entire household, believed. So she was pretty influential. Then not only did she just believe in Jesus, she decided to act on her faith, and she opened up her house to Paul and all his followers and provided them a place to stay. She was a pretty amazing woman. So I love this story because it shares about Paul going to preach to women and how Lydia believed and many others came to believe in Jesus as well. Lydia was an incredibly influential person. And so I'm sure even after this experience, she continued to share about Jesus and lead others to faith in Christ. So what does this story mean for y'all? So Paul followed God. He changed his plans, and he followed God to somewhere where he didn't quite sure know what was going to happen. But he went, and because he went, some great things happened. So God could be leading you today or sometime in the future, and you may not understand why God's leading you to do something, but know that if God is leading you, that to trust in God, because you never know what's going to happen. Okay? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. Please help us to remember to always trust where you lead us to go because we never know what great things you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. For our text this morning, we turn to the story of Lydia in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision... 
we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Please stand for our offertory hymn, number 584. <clears throat> come to your house and worship you Lord and please Lord we want to ask you to please be with this offering and may it be betterment of your kingdom Lord please go with us each and every day Lord and let us walk with you in Jesus name amen
Please stand for the doxology. You know, throughout our lives, we make a lot of decisions. Some of those decisions are small, like what am I going to wear today or what am I going to eat today? Some are big, like what am I going to do now that I've graduated? Or who should I marry? Or what's the next step in my life? Should I I serve my country in some way? How? When it comes to decisions, they all impact us. Even some decisions that aren't our own. The impact may be small or it may be significant. It may be physical. It may be emotional. But all decisions impact us nonetheless. Even, say, fictional decisions. You know, the decisions that our characters make in our favorite TV shows or books or movies... Or or whatever, they they can affect how we feel. Or maybe in sports, when our favorite athlete gets traded to another team, or uh, a coach is fired or leaves or retires. You know, in the overall scheme of life, we'd probably acknowledge that those decisions don't really matter. But they sure impact how we feel. They impact our emotions. And then there's real life examples and politics and the legal realm, decisions that are made that impact our lives in very real ways. The decisions of our loved ones and their actions impact us directly. In some ways they may call us to pull away from loved ones. In other ways they may reconcile us with loved ones or draw us closer. But everywhere we turn, in everything we do, both inwardly and outwardly, we're surrounded by decisions. And sometimes those decisions catch us by surprise. We don't see them coming. Sometimes we even surprise ourselves with the decisions that we make. Someone once said, and I have no idea who it was, but I've read it in various places, that life really is a culmination of all the decisions that we make. And you know, if you think about it in the big picture scheme of life, it's true. Many of our decisions, even ones at the time seem minor, wind up impacting the whole course of our life. Sometimes in surprising ways. Just to give you one example, when I was deciding where to go to college, I was like, eh, I'm going to go wherever, you know, I can get the best deal, you know, and education's an education. But where I went to college led to where I got a summer job, where I got a summer job led to who I met, and who I met on my summer job is who I married and who I have children with, and you know, my whole course of my life is the sum of those decisions. But I never would have thought when I was 18 years old deciding where I was going to go to college that A would lead to B would lead to C. Our text for the day is filled with surprising decisions. Some seemingly insignificant, some very significant. But they're all surprising in how they shape the very course of lives and even history. 
You know, with all the major surprises in the book of Acts, the story of Lydia's conversion seems relatively minor, all things considered. So why is it included? Why does the story of one woman's decision matter? Why give her top billing among these other far more dramatic and stunning events in the book of Acts? Well, I'm convinced the story is there to remind us that God has always worked to change the world one surprising decision, one life at a time. As you break down the story, you quickly realize there's a lot going on here besides one woman's conversion. There's a series of events or decisions that lead to this moment. And it begins with Paul's surprising decision to change his travel plans. He had originally planned to head to Bithynia, which would be in modern northwest Turkey. But instead, he makes the decision to head to Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece. And if I'd thought about it, I would have got a map to put up on the screen, but they're in opposite directions. So he literally changes and goes the opposite way. And it's a surprising decision because Paul is not a man known for changing his mind once he's made it up. But with this change, of course, Paul lands in the city of Philippi, which was a leading city in the ancient world. It's a city that was founded in, I think, 356 BCE by Philip of Macedon, who was Alexander the Great's father. Um, you, you history majors probably know who all those people are. But it had been a relatively unknown village, from what I understand, until Emperor Augustus needed a place to put all of his veterans from his conquering wars. And he picked this village because it was in a, a pretty location. There was a lot of available land. So he designates it a retirement sanctuary city for all of these retired army officers. So the city goes then from a small little village to a city of 15,000 plus with the influx of all these army officers and the people needed to serve them. So you get this social makeup of the city that's got about 5% ruling elite, the, the connected, the politicians. About 20% of those folks are the, the landowners, the army officers who've come there to retire. Then you've got a working class of about 50% who were there to provide skills, trades, services to the other 25%. And then there's about 25% of people who came to this area as it was growing, hoping to find work and a means of supporting their families, but didn't. So about a quarter of the population lives in poverty. That's not out of the ordinary for an ancient city. In all honesty, it's not out of the ordinary for a modern city. But what is surprising, though, is that there weren't a lot of Jewish folks in this city because of who made up this population, because of who they came from, people loyal to the Roman Empire. There weren't that many people of Jewish heritage there. There's not even a synagogue in the city, which is surprising because up until this point in Paul's ministry, every city he's visited, he started his ministry in that city in the synagogues. When he begins preaching and teaching, the synagogue is the first place he stops. But he chooses a city that doesn't even have one, that is very Greco-Roman in nature. So that leads to the second surprising decision. Where's he going to go? Where's he going, where's he going to preach? Where's he going to teach? Well, he heads outside the city gate to where the NRSV translates to where he supposed there was some sort of place of prayer. Obviously, Paul had heard something like, well, you know, those who, who believe in God, they, they gather over here by the river to, to pray on the Sabbath. So he's like, okay, I'll go there. He seeks out these Gentile worshipers of God. Not Jews in a synagogue, but Gentile worshipers who have somewhere along the way 
heard of the one true God, Yahweh, and have chosen to follow him versus their typical pagan gods of their culture. And it's here that we meet a woman who surprises us to this very day. Lydia rises up from the text and stands before us as kind of a super spiritual Mary and a hospitable, hard-working Martha rolled all into one. She is a woman with her heart tuned to God who is still all about getting stuff done. I mean, if you look at Lydia's life, just from that little bit we have, you can see that it's a life filled with surprising decisions. She's a dealer in purple cloth, which you learned if you listen to the children's sermon, that is very expensive. It's only afforded by the, the most elite of the elite. One of the reasons that the color purple was the color of royalty was because it was so doggone expensive to buy, they were the only ones that could afford it. So Lydia's business is one of significance. She's offering a product that not just anybody has. So she's important. And so what we gather there is somewhere along the line, she made the decision that she may live in a man's world, a world dominated by patriarchy, but she's going to go out and get hers, whether anybody else likes it or not. And she did. She chose to give it a go in a business world, in an ancient world that would not have been very open to that. And on top of that, we're told that she's the head of her household which means she's not associated with any man at all. She owns her own property. She's in charge of her own house. She's a worshiper of God. She's already, so she's already made that decision to leave behind the paganism of her culture. I mean, she's literally misindependent of the Bible. And then she chooses to become the first convert to Christianity in Europe. This is a woman who paves her own path. You know, and the namesake for my daughter, and I wonder why she's the way she is. You know, we're all familiar with some of Paul's other writings and, and, and his attitude toward women and other places in Scripture, but I imagine he knew better than to tell this one to be silent. But upon hearing Paul's presentation of the gospel and converting, along with leading her whole household to do so, she then turns around and invites Paul and his companions to stay in her house. Yet another surprising decision for a woman to invite a bunch of strange men to crash at her house. What would people think? Was she crazy? Well, she didn't care. There's no telling how many people came to know Jesus at Lydia's house as it essentially became the church led by her initiative there in that city. It was there that the Christian movement, which would overtake all of Europe in coming generations, began with a woman who blazed her own trail. But none of those surprising decisions, Paul's or Lydia's, would have been possible without an acute awareness of the presence of God. In the biblical narrative, a sense of awareness of God's movement and action is not an exception. It's a norm. In countless story after story after story, Old Testament, New Testament, we meet people who are at least somewhat in tune with what God is doing and what God is up to. They're somewhat attuned to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So this meeting of the successful independent businesswoman and the zealous missionary would not have happened without some human awareness of what God was up to. Paul and Lydia and the Holy Spirit are working together to make this meeting happen. If Paul hadn't veered off his chosen path, if Lydia had not made the surprising decision to make her own decisions, then this doesn't happen. Surprising decisions have surprising results. 
Paul does his part, Lydia does hers, and God uses these decisions to give those surprising results that otherwise would have been impossible. You know, these events and acts go down well before the idea of any kind of formal church structure is developed. And there's people left and right making the surprising decision to follow Christ. Taking them far from their established cultural norms and their comfort zones. Their traditional religion of their family and for generations. Something special starts happening here in Macedonia. The gospel crosses a threshold. It takes off. The spark is lit. And the gospel gains some serious momentum in this moment. Largely because of a couple of decisions. As we think then about how this text challenges us, let us think about how remarkable really Paul and Lydia's decisions are. Their decisiveness is uncanny. Unlike so many of us in the 21st century, as they both sensed God leading them to do something, they did it. Sure, it was surprising to those around them, probably even controversial, probably surprised to even themselves. I imagine there were times Lydia's probably like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I don't even know these people. But they didn't stop and overthink it. They just did. Without hesitation, without red tape, without bureaucracy. Now they probably weren't Baptists because there's no committee involved here. But they turned a house into a base camp for the Christianization of Europe. Surprising decisions resulting in surprising, creative, life-giving ministry. Ministry which broke the rules but changed the world. So what about us? If we feel led to do something, do we do it? Or do we stop and think of the million and a half reasons why we can't? Do we avoid surprising decisions, ministries, and actions because they're too far outside the box, just a little too far outside our comfort zone? All too often, myself included, we're content to ask the question, what if, rather than just finding out. In such a mentality, I'm absolutely convinced, limits our ability to discern and be aware of where God is leading. In the early 90s, there was a Gallup poll asking whether or not believers had ever experienced a sense of direction, awareness, or vision from God. Surprisingly, a little over half of the believers surveyed said that they had, that they had felt God had led them to do something or in a certain direction. Now what is unfortunate but unsurprising is that almost none of them had ever acted on it. I mean, honestly, if we were to talk openly about ideas and God's involvement in our lives and how we felt the Lord leading us, if we were more open about being aware of what God is trying to get us to do, we might actually have to do it. Or worse yet, we might not even be in control. But on the flip side, if we're more open to God's direction in our lives, we just might find ourselves more open to receive the direction that will change our lives, our community, our world, and lead us to make our own surprising decisions for the kingdom of God. Surprising decisions in the pursuit of authentic mission, and this is a quote, I'm not sure who said it. But surprising decisions in the pursuit of authentic mission are always a response to the leading of God and a response to need. As we think about how we respond to God's calling and the decisions we make, the direction we go, the paths we choose, 
This text serves us well in reminding us of that. That decisions in the pursuit of authentic mission are rooted in God's calling and in need. When we're open to it, God will surprise us with what God can do. God will surprise us with what we can do. I read a really neat story recently about a man. His name was Michael Belester. And he was traveling in Poland in the 1930s, not long before World War II began. And he met a man in the village there, and they were having a conversation. And come to find out, in this whole town, there wasn't a single Bible. And he happened to be traveling with one, and he felt led to give it to this man. And this man went on to read the Bible and accept Christ, then passed the Bible on to a neighbor who read the Bible and accepted Christ. And this one Bible made its way through the whole town, a couple of hundred people, the majority of whom became Christians. Some years later, Belester returned to the village And a church had formed from all of these new believers. And they had asked him, you're the man responsible for for us coming to know Christ. Will you please come to our church and share? Well, instead of preaching, he gets up and he asks the town people what some of their favorite verses of Scripture are. And one man stands up and says, perhaps we've misunderstood. Did you mean verses or chapters? Because they only had one Bible among them, these villagers had memorized entire chapters and books of Scripture. Michael recounted in his writings that 13 people had memorized the entirety of both Matthew and Luke. His own surprising decision to give his own Bible away had led to the surprising result of an entire village memorizing Scripture. And converting to Christianity. The surprising results of one Bible had borne the fruit of hundreds of lives changed. And this story of a little town in Poland reminds us that the faithfulness of one person's decision can lead to one person's life changed. And when one person's life is changed, when one little Bible is shared, or one surprising small decision is made for God's kingdom, he can be the tiny spark that surprisingly shakes the foundations of entire communities. Paul's decision to change his travel plans, Lydia's decision to open her heart, mind, and home, changed the entire face of Christianity. It was the gateway to the gospel going around the world. What decisions might we make today that could change our lives, our community, our world? When we're open to making surprising decisions for Christ, we open ourselves to surprising results. What surprises might lay in store for us. Amen. Please stand for our hymn of invitation number 407.
Our Father, we thank you so much for this day, for the time we've had to worship together. We ask that you would go with us now, lead us, guide us, and direct us. Keep us safe through the coming week. These things we ask in your name. Amen. 